This is Covering the Spread, part of the FanDuel Podcast Network. Tuesday is definitely my favorite days here on Covering the Spread because we get to cover the whole game. We're talking NFL week number four. Later on, we are talking the Sanderson Farms Championship with Brandon Gadula. And right now, we're talking strikeout props with Rob Friedman, pitching ninja, getting you set for Tuesday night on the Diamond. This is Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network and NumberFire.com. My name is Jim Sadas. I am a senior writer and analyst for NumberFire.com. Joined here, as I mentioned, by Rob Friedman. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja find his work over at Fox Sports, MLB, Nesson, Peacock, everywhere. And of course, you're uncovering the spread each Tuesday as well. Rob, only two Tuesdays left in the regular season, but sounds like we're going to have some uh, postseason talk later on as well. I am pumped for that. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm delightful. I get to watch some fun baseball. Uh, I think that that's always fun. It is kind of dicey this time of year you know talking i play a lot of dfs that's dicey uh you know strikeout props can be dicey but i think for tonight it's a lot of what i I, the word i would use to describe the pitchers for tonight is fun that's the first word i would turn to for the guys pitching tonight i think that's fair i'm I'm kind of excited for it too because it is a kind of a crap shoot right now and we were talking off off camera about how yeah. long guys stay in. Yep. Maybe some have an extra incentive to stay in because if you're you know you're close to a spot or you're fighting for something, mm-hmm. you're going to leave your guys in. But then others, there's no real reason to, and you just have to figure it out. Do they need work? Do they not? And know. that's a big part of it. And, and I think that you, because you pay so much attention to baseball, you're going to have a good handle on that. So I think that for me, I go into the pretty high trust level uh, in your analysis on this stuff. So let's dive into this Tuesday slate and look at what your number, what you're, what you're thinking about Tuesday night. Like I said, a lot of fun pitchers of those fun guys. Who are you turning to for tonight in the strikeout prop market? So, so I have Blake Snell, seven K's or more. Lance McCullers, seven K's or more. And then Shane Bieber for seven K's or more as a three leg parlay. Now, with the Snell one, my numbers have Blake Snell projected for 8.2 strikeouts for tonight. You've got him at seven plus strikeouts. And like, I felt a little bit nervous about that with my projection being that high on him because it's the Dodgers. But I think Snell's pitching well enough where he can overcome even that kind of matchup. And it seems like you agree with that as well. I absolutely do. And I think, um, number one, he's proving something because he's been inconsistent. And now I think he's found his form. And when he does, Snell is a Snell's a monster. I mean, Snellzilla can rack up the K's with anybody. I mean, he has you know multiple pitches with a ton of whiffs. So I like that. And I thought his last outing was one of the best I've seen all year, like just absolutely dominant. And I wouldn't ex- I think he is going to want to set the tone. Um, they still have something to play for, and I right. like him. Yeah. Yeah. I think that was part of I have the Padres money line in this game, and part of it was the Dodgers are on cruise control. Like you look at their lineups each night. They're like, okay, cool. We got the one seed lock, locked up. We're good to go. And you can tell that. And that that factors into the money line, but also factors in for the Snell tr- strikeout prop. Now we were talking about pitch counts. Pitch counts being dicey. Dusty Baker don't care. Lance McCullers, he's going deep in games. I know that like they're pretty firm in where they're at, but I think they. it seems like they want McCullers to be like ramped up coming off that injury is that kind of your line of thinking on him as well literally my exact okay. line of thinking on that uh, number one lance is about as competitive as anybody on the yeah. bump um his stuff is filthy and i don't think he gets enough credit for it and then they want to stretch him out he has something to prove himself because he hasn't been there all year and wants to show that he is the man for the postseason and he's locked in because that is a great pitching staff yeah and you know there's not a lot locked in on that yeah, it's definitely not. And I think that for for me, the, I was going through McCullers' numbers last night, and I was concerned because of the walk rate. But then you look at his pitches per plate appearance, he's still weirdly efficient. Despite walking guys, he doesn't waste a lot of pitches. And I think that that, to me, was pretty encouraging for uh, the strikeout uh, number on McCullers here. Now, the one you were talking about before the show, if you were saying, you know, if there's one that's going to, you know, wreck this, it's the Bieber one. Over six and a half frame individually is minus 102. Your concern here seems to stem around potentially pitch count, given Cleveland's positioning. They've got the AL Central. I, they're, they're locked in the postseason at this point already. So what still pushed you towards the over on this number? Because I do agree with you, six and a half seems pretty fair uh, against the Rays. Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's really facing the Rays. Still, like, I'm on the fence with him wanting to prove something or not. He's proven a ton. Yeah. But to keep his ERA below three, I think, is a big deal to him. 
Um, as well as like when he's on, he just does rack up Ks. But regardless of his velocity, his velocity's down. Doesn't matter. Yeah. He still knows how to pitch. I think, you know, I can see a situation where he maybe gets pulled for pitch count to save him some. And that's kind of what I was factoring in. I'd like him a lot more if it was a, you know, a tighter situation. Yeah. That being said, you know, his stuff is good enough to just run through um, that Rays lineup. And with the Rays specifically being a high strikeout team, I think that gives you leeway where even if that he does leave exactly early, it. it's yep. going to help out things out there quite a bit. If you pair those three together, that's plus 457. That's a good number. I, I think that given what my numbers say about McCullers and Bieber specifically, I think that's a good number uh, for that trio of strikeout props there. Now, the one I wanted to ask you about today, I actually do have one uh, for today, one I found that I liked. I've got Michael Waka over four and a half. Uh, it's over at FanDuel Sportsbook. That is even money right now. Now, Waka has the motivation questions for sure, given Boston's positioning right now. But I feel like ever since he came back, he's looked pretty good in general. What's your read been on him specifically since he rejoined that rotation? Um, his his changeup is is phenomenal, and I think that's what leads him. Um, he has been he's just been great. Like he is their ace, and I actually you know you mentioned I do work for Nesson. He he won my Red Sox starting pitcher of the year <laughs> okay. and he deserves it like he's yeah. he I mean what is he 11 and one with a two seven and you know i the strikeouts it's tricky with him right like sure. he's a he's a four and five guy and occasionally we'll get more than that i do like that number i mean i think that he has personally something to prove um there's no reason to let up for him and you know it, it definitely wouldn't surprise me to see him yeah, I think the thing I like about Waka is the efficiency. He's going to get right. you six, maybe seven innings each and every time. So he's going to get a lot of chances at those strikeouts. And that, to me, makes me feel better about him. I've got him projected for 5.8 tonight. That seems a little bit rich based on he doesn't have a ton of like up, up, upside, but he'll be around four or five. I can guarantee you that for today based on his track record. That's exactly what I see. And and I, I would, you know, err on the side of on the high side, I think, with him. Mm -hmm. um, and I think he's one of those guys that nobody's really paid attention to. Yeah. And he's had a great season. Um, and that's one reason why I love that pick just to call some attention to how good Waka has been this year. Yeah. Well, pitching ninjas, Red Sox pitcher of the year, Michael Waka. We'll see if he can live up to that, uh, that high billing for tonight against the Orioles. Again, even money on him over four and a half strikeouts. That is Rob Freeman. Check him out on Twitter at pitching ninja. As you mentioned, you can find his work over at Nesson Fox sports, MLB and Peacock as well. Rob, I appreciate the time. Enjoy watching all these fun pitchers. We didn't even talk about Robbie Ray. He's pitching tonight too. So it's a lot of fun guys. Enjoy the baseball. We'll talk to you once again next week. Absolutely. Thanks again, Jim. Thank you as always. Again, Rob Friedman on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Awesome, awesome, awesome stuff there as always. And I do like all those picks he mentioned as well with these strikeout props. We're going to get to Brandon Gadula to break down the Sanderson Farms Championship here in just one second. But first, Twisted T and FanDuel have joined forces to bring you a one of a kind contest series. That gives you a chance to compete for your share of thousands of dollars in site credit. Introducing Twisted T's College Football Picks, a sports betting focused contest series that is entirely free to play. The contest is simple. Each college football game will be assigned a money line spread and total market with assigned points to each market. All you have to do is make six selections based on those three markets and earn points for each correct selection you made. If at the end of the day, your score ranks among the best in the contest, You'll be eligible for your share of site credit. Head over to fanduel.com slash twisted T picks and make your picks. And remember, please drink responsibly. We have more PGA coming up for this week. We got the Sanderson Farms Championship coming off of the President's Cups. So let's bring in Brandon Gadula right now. You can find Brandon on Twitter at Gadula13. Brandon President's Cup in the books. USA got the win there. Jordan Spieth, friend of FanDuel, going nuts. So how are you doing? Good, good. Yeah, it was, uh, you know, it was it was expected to be a, a pretty lopsided event. Uh, U.S. was basically minus 700 to pick up the win. I had I, I tried to simulate that one out. I had it about roughly 80, 20. Um, yeah. And that felt a little bit high for the international side. But they got off to a slow start, but they battled back. And I mean, you know, in the end, not as close as uh, like a coin flip, but there were a few matches that, you know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, if they went a little bit differently, then 
I think that U.S. team <laughs> would be sweating even a little bit more than they were. So as a ended up ended up being a, a fun one. Yeah, there had been a spread on the points. I'm not sure I, there might have been, but I feel like the international team probably at least flirted with that spread. If that were actually a thing you could do for President's Cup. OK, this week at the Sanderson Farms Championship, not quite the same names that we had for the President's Cup. Obviously, it's at the Country Club of Jackson. What do we need to know about this course to bet this week, Brandon? Yeah, definitely not the who we saw last week, but we do see Sam Burns, uh, the defending champ, uh, plus 950 uh, to win. And, and it makes sense that he is plus 950 uh, to win coming out of the President's Cup because this course should really fit what he does best. We've seen the Country Club of Jackson on the PGA Tour since 2015. So there's no shortage of data, but driving distance is a help. It's not a prerequisite. There are some guys who play this course well without being long off the tee but you can pull driver and kind of cut some corners a little bit so that's relevant and we know that sam burns just nukes it off the tee so that kind of kind of checks out there and um, there are some narrow fairways but i'm not really like factoring that in um and, and if you look at the strokes gained stats it's really just strokes gained off, off the tee that correlates well strokes gained Ranks 14th, uh, that correlation between total strokes gain and strokes gain off the tee ranks 14th of 48 courses in my database. So uh, I always like to just use uh, strokes gain off the tee here because that's kind of what we're what we're looking at um, in terms of what actually matters. You don't have to be long. You don't have, have to be accurate. Just be one of them because it's a bit of a demanding course off the tee. Or I guess if you're not getting strokes off the tee, you're just falling behind at, at a course like this. But other than that, Pretty straightforward setup. Um, if you pull up Data Golf's course table uh, and you look at the different stats and how they rank among all of the courses with shot link data, this one's like right down the middle and so many different stats. Um, so there's not like one specific advantage from there uh, that, that you'll see uh, getting a leg up. That said, where we really see a lot of separation generally is strokes gained putting. Uh, it's not a full on putting competition. We've seen some bad putters win. Sam Burns actually lost uh, strokes in putting when he won. Uh, Sergio Garcia won here. Um, so it, it, it's not necessarily like a full on prerequisite, but guys who maybe putt really well, especially on Bermuda greens, which is what we get this week can get a leg up. And someone like Danny McCarthy, he's finished top 20 here four straight years. You and I, we talk about Denny McCarthy very little uh, when we're breaking down things from a DFS standpoint because there aren't many courses that fit Denny McCarthy. But, you know, he can hit some fairways and then putt well on these greens. So it's a there's not one specific archetype. But if I was looking for one specific archetype, it would be guys who do have added distance, uh, guys who obviously have good iron play and then guys who putt well. And honestly, though, the the subset of golfers who are long and putt well, pretty small. Yeah, so that's why it feels uh, a little bit scary to fade Sam Burns if we're going to consider uh, going that route. So let's talk about that. Burns is plus nine fifty at FanDuel Sportsbook. So Heath Gala is number two. He's eighteen to one. So Burns, the runaway favorite here, but he is a guy who can putt pretty well. Not a bomber, but he's not short, and he is good at placement off the tee. Is that enough for you to show value on Burns, or is plus nine fifty too short for your liking? So in my win simulation model, it's it's a bit too short. Um, I think from a more subjective angle, it makes sense. Mm -hmm. Um, I'll talk about Burns a little bit later in more detail, but, uh, that way we're, we're not totally missing out if, if Burns comes out hot, but, um, I think I'm probably out on an outright, uh, on Sam Burns. Okay. Any outrights that you do like based on the odds for this week? Uh, Taylor Montgomery is uh, 26 to one on FanDuel Sportsbook. Again, I'm looking for basically if there's distance added, that's a benefit. If not, it's it's not the biggest deal. But uh, T15 and distance last year on the Corn Ferry Tour, um, this is definitely not the best stat, but he was second in putts per round on the Corn Ferry Tour as well. Probably over a full season, that stuff averages out a little bit. But you know, putts per round, you could stick it to two feet from with your wedges or whatever, and then you're not a good putter. But you know, that's that's a conversation for another time. But he does kind of have that. If we can trust those stats, he then has a rare combination of distance. As I think uh, on the PGA Tour, the putting is really good in that sample. It's a little bit scary uh, to putt that well, but it also kind of backs up the, the stats we saw on the Corn Ferry Tour. So I like him at 26 to 1. Scott Stallings, 29 to 1. He's got some power off the tee. 
I have him in the 86th percentile in long-term uh, adjusted iron play, uh, so strokes gain approach. Good putter overall, good on Bermuda, which is the greens we get this week, and good course form for Stallings, which is never a must, but whenever you see that, that backed up, it definitely helps uh, with the confidence. Wyndham Clark is 50-1. to 1. He is super long off the tee. He's a good putter. It's, a again, just a really rare combo to have someone just hit it really far and be a good putter. Um, but this is the kind of week where he could pop. So I think Wyndham Clark 50 to one makes sense. He's also good on Bermuda. And then another, uh, the, the final one here, because I think if you're fading Burns, you, you can be a little bit more open and, and take on a few more uh, options. Uh, Carl Yuan, 75 to one. He was seventh in driving distance on the Corn Ferry Tour last year. Just average putting stats overall, but he ranked top five in strokes gained teeter green per round at the Fortinet, and I stress per round because he missed the cut because the putter wasn't there. But there's you know so, there's some risk, especially mm-hmm. if he's going to be an average putter, uh, maybe a little bit of a weaker putter. But if he's got that cheetah green game going, then I think that makes some sense at, at seventy five to one. Okay, if you had to pick one of those, would it be Montgomery or who would yeah. you go with? Okay, Montgomery twenty six uh, is the pick there. Okay, any other bet, bet stand out to you? Mentioned a Burns one. Uh, what's your route to exposure on him? Uh, first round leader. Okay. Uh, 22 to one. I think so. this is the, the subjective part of it. He's, he's either going to be, so he went Oh three and two at the president's cup. So he didn't get a win, uh, but he played really well. He was actually bogged down at times by his good buddy, Scotty Scheffler. Wow. Um, it's kind of, yeah, it was kind of a thing. Um, so he, I, he could, I was like searching Scheffler's no, I was searching for president's cup results and like someone was like grading everyone. Speed got an A, Scheffler got an F and I was like, ah, yeah, I think the <laughs> I think the only grade you could give Scheffler was an F based on Dang. expectations um, for being the number one player in the world. He was my I thought he'd be the anchor. I thought he would just be like, you know, guys yeah. follow me, like I'll lead by example, and just wasn't there. Um, didn't have the putter, but yeah, I think so. I'm having trouble with Burns because he's mm-hmm. one of the few guys. Sebastian Munoz actually withdrew. Um, and then I think just Christian Bezaden Hote uh, also played the President's Cup, but he didn't play a lot. So I think Sam Burns is either going to be tired out from playing the President's Cup, sure. maybe a little bit partied out as well. But <laughs> what are you implying, he, Brandon? <laughs> but he's the he's also the defending champ. Again, he did not pick up a win. That might uh, impact him, you know, just mentally. And also, he is a lot better than everyone else in this field. Yeah. Uh, so Sam Burns, first round leader, twenty two to one. I think he'll either come out hot and be like, okay, I should have just went with Burns or he'll kind of fade it, fade and not have it. Sure. I don't really see him grinding out from, you know, a T40 after the first round. So that's the, my exposure, maybe a half unit on that just to get a little bit of protection from a Sam Burns runaway. But I was like Denny McCarthy, top 10, that's plus 410. Um, I have him at th- uh, plus 350 in my win simulation model uh, based on his top 10 odds. Uh, he has great course form. Again, not long off the tee. We definitely know that, but just a fantastic putter. Um, four straight top 20s here. Great on Bermuda as well. Um, I think he's also kind of in play for a first round leader at, at uh, plus or at uh, yeah, 48 to one in case the putter runs hot early. Yeah. Uh, that's a high variance play, but maybe he falls off. It's a high variance there. market, though. So that's actually yeah. fine. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then last one here Andrew Putnam, top 10. That's plus 850. Um, he's definitely not long. Uh, I have him in the second percentile in driving distance over the past 50 rounds, according to Fantasy Nationals data. But a really, really good short game, really strong Bermuda putter. And frankly, just the the long-term adjusted strokes gain numbers, a bit too good uh, for him to be you know plus 850 to, to finish top 10 in this field. So I think those are great odds. Plus 850, uh, just honestly great odds for top 10s. Uh, so I, I think Putnam uh, is definitely someone that will be thrown on the card. So we get Burns to start hot and then Montgomery to finish hot. Uh, we get the, we can get both, you know, por que no los dos. Yeah. I mean, first round leaders on favorites, you're going to get go from basically like, again, this week we have plus 950 to plus 2200 plus 950 doesn't really excite me um, ever, but plus 2200 sounds good, yeah. uh, especially. And there's, yeah, there's a lot more variance. That's why those numbers are right. Are the there's a reason are, for but, it, but, but you could, you know, you can model it out and Burns is a, a, a little bit closer to value there. Um, at plus 2200. 
All righty. We'll see how things go for the Sanderson Farms Championship. That is Brandon Gadula. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula13. Check out all of his simulations over at numberfire.com as well. And the Heat Check Fantasy Podcast over on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast. Brandon, thank you to you. Good luck for this week. And is there another event next week that I can talk to you about? Because I've looked ahead. I, I don't bother yet. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, I forget what it is already. Okay. Well, we'll talk to you next week then. Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, yeah, we'll talk. All righty, Jim. We that got is... we got golf all the time. Oh, so. buddy, don't don't I know it? Don't I know it? This time of year, that is Brandon Gadula again. Check him out on Twitter at Gadula thirteen to check out all of his PGA DFS and PGA betting work. So we talk some baseball. Let's talk some golf. Let's now take our first look ahead at week number four in the NFL and take a look at where my numbers are showing some value for this week and whether I am betting that, whether I agree with that or not. The first one that I do agree with is the Washington money line. They are currently plus 144 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. They're taking on Dallas Cowboys for this week. Obviously, the Cowboys now 2-0 uh, since uh, 2-0 with Cooper Rush at the helm. I don't necessarily buy into that, though. Washington's money line is plus 150 at FanDuel Sportsbook. Dallas, in my model, is favored by 0.15 points. So basically a toss-up. So you're getting the uh, Washington Commanders at about a 40% win odds versus roughly around 50% by my model. Uh, I think that the worry here in terms of this bet losing is that we just saw the Washington offensive line get bullied by the Dallas D- or by the Philadelphia defensive line. And... Like the Cowboys can do the same thing. So that's a concern for me, but I do still think this Washington offense has a decent amount of juice. Um, I don't super buy into what Cooper rush has done so far. So to me getting Washington plus plus one fifty, forty 40% implied odds to win. That's pretty hard for me to turn down. So I will take them uh, on the money line here. Another money line I like on a dog is the Titans money line at plus plus one forty eight. If you can find a three and a half out out there, I'd probably take that on the spread versus going at the money line. Just get that increased flexibility. Uh, There are, there's only one three and a half that I saw earlier on out there. So most likely scenario, you're betting uh, the money line here at plus 148 on the Titans. Uh, the line is plus three minus one Oh four at FanDuel Sportsbook. So that one may get to three and a half there. If you want to hold off and try to go, uh, for the spread instead. But the reason I like the, the Titans here is that I've got the Titans favored in this game by 1.1 points. That is potentially optimistic, but the reason I'm okay buying into that is that my numbers have been low on the Titans the entire off season. It's hard to project a good offense when you take away AJ Brown and add in a couple rookies and Traylon Burks and Kyle Phillips who's banged up to be the leaders of this offense, the focal points of this offense. Robert Woods looked pretty good in that uh, Las Vegas game. Sounds like he's getting more acclimated coming off of his torn ACL. Uh, Traylon Burks, full snap share for him this past week. They're not getting him the ball downfield very much yet, but that's kind of what happened at Arkansas too. So I don't know. They've just been efficient. My numbers like the Titans last week and I did not bet it, but adding what they did last week, add in the fact that the Colts, I don't think really played up to maybe perception in that, that chiefs game. They had a lot of luck, a lot of bounces go their way. So I have the Titans favorite in this game, which is why I want to go with the money line at plus 148. But I also don't mind if you want to wait for three and a half, it might get there at FanDuel uh, just based on the fact that it's minus 104 at the uh, minus at the plus three right now. If you want to hold out for three and a half or you find three and a half, totally feel free to go that way. But based on my numbers with the Titans being favored, I'm okay taking the plus 148 in the money line and plugging them in there. We'll see if Derrick Henry can go nuts. So in this game, hopefully he can to make this look a little bit easier. Third money line, also a dog. It's Denver. I know. Um, I, I'm showing value on the Cardinals as well. I'm not. I have not bet that. I probably won't. I can't do that to myself again. And you would think I'd have the same sentiment towards Denver based on the way things have gone. I know they got me a win this past week. We'll talk about that and recapping last week in just a second. But I've got Denver favored by three points here. The Broncos have not played well, but neither the Raiders. I know the Raiders have like been close in their games thus far, but I'm not sure they played well just yet. You look at the depth that the Broncos have in their secondary. I think that positions them well to both have a handle on Devontae Adams, but then also mop up with the guys like Matt Collins, Darren Waller, who can also beat you in other ways. So I like the the defensive matchup for the Denver defense versus the Raiders offense. 
And I think that this Raiders defense is sneaky, sneaky bad. Like, again, talked about the Titans last week. Robert Woods showing up there. Part of that was the Titans maybe outperforming my expectations, but also the Raiders defense kind of stinks in the secondary. If you can keep the quarterback upright, I feel like they'll have a lot of success. So the Denver money line right now is at plus 112 over at FanDuel Sportsbook. I do think that is a good value. I'm willing to bet that, and I will take the money line there. So showing a lot of value in dogs this week, same thing it's been the first couple weeks. Sounds like the public is pretty into favorites. So uh, the the money line underdogs I like for this week, not specifically seeking them out, but showing value on them. Washington plus 150, Tennessee plus 148, and Denver plus 112. All three of those to me, pretty good value bets and spots where I either have as a toss up or the the underdog being favored in those games. One underdog where I'm taking the points as opposed to the money line is the Rams. Rams are plus two and a half right now against San Francisco. I've got the Rams favorite here by 0. 0.13 points, but I do want the extra flexibility in a game where the totals come crashing down. It was, I think, like 40. It was up a couple. Uh, if we were looking yesterday, total night game was a bit higher. It came crashing down. This is a Monday night game, by the way. Uh, it's now down to 42 and a half. So you see the spread or the total coming down. That lends itself towards more, uh, you know, taking the points effectively. So Denver, or sorry, Los Angeles plus two and a half right now. Again, I've been favored by 0.13. And part of the reason why I had them favored, despite the fact the Rams haven't played all that well so far, is the Trent Williams injury. Trent Williams is arguably the best offensive lineman in football high ankle sprain. He will miss four to six weeks. He will not play this weekend that impacts San Francisco in every aspect of their offense. So you take away Trent Williams and you take a, a probably below average quarterback in Jimmy Garoppolo and put him in a less optimal situation. Still not a bad situation. George Kittle, Brandon, Ayuk, Debo Samuel, all those guys, it's still a good situation, but it's not the best situation, which is what Garoppolo has dealt with for most of his time here in San Francisco. So to me, it's kind of a situation where you've got the Rams defensive line facing off against an offensive line that doesn't have Trent Williams and has some holes on the interior at one of those spots. So I think it's a situation where you just kind of go with the, the Rams plus two and a half here, minus 110 because of the situation you have with Trent Williams missing this game. I think that there is value there. So I'll go with the Rams plus two and a half. Money line is plus 108, obviously showing a bit of value there, but I prefer to go and take the points at um, at plus two and a half. There are a couple totals I like. As I've mentioned previously, I don't have a totals model, so don't have specific numbers to show me that these are actual values. I do have a way to project out each team's offensive efficiency, though. And looking at that cross-referencing versus each team's pace, I like the under for both the Browns and Falcons at 49 and a half and the under for the Lions and Seahawks at 50 Browns and Falcons. uh, Both these teams have been pretty efficient to open the year. And my model does know that it's accounting for that a bit, but it's still a lower efficiency game. Both teams like to run the ball quite a bit. 49 and a half is a pretty big number. The miles Garrett injury. I'm not sure what his situation might be following his car crash last night, but based on reading you know, the situation there, it sounds like it was pretty minor. I don't really know. No, no broken bones from what I read. So there's a chance he plays this week. That'd be a good thing for the under here. The Browns, I mean, I've been pretty impressed by Jacoby Brissett, but at the end of the day, this is a game quarterback by Marcus Mariota, who I adore, and Jacoby Brissett, and the total is 49 and a half. Even with this game being indoors, even with the Falcons defense not being, you know, elite by any means, like they played pretty well so far. I think this total is way too high. So 49 and a half to me and under does uh, does look pretty tasty. And I will take that uh, for the Browns and Falcons. Other total I like is the Lions and Seahawks under 50. Now, the Lions are an over team. I think we can say that definitively based on the way things have gone so far this year. A very competent offense, a not as competent defense. So that sets up well for an over. But the Seahawks do not. The Seahawks offense is like the most under offense of all time. If things are going well, if they're moving the ball efficiently, they're going to run the football. That drains clock. That keeps the the clock rolling and does help things as far as uh, getting ourselves towards an under. On the Lions side of things, DeAndre Swift is going to miss this game most likely, it seems like. And running backs don't impact things too much. But I think Swift is one of the guys who does in the sense that he can actually spring a big play. Running the ball typically lends itself towards an under. The times where you can get an over is when it's a big play. And Swift is a guy who is far more capable of that than Jamal Williams, 
Craig Reynolds, Justin Jackson, whoever may be filling in for DeAndre Swift for this week. So to me, you get this total of at 50. And I think it's just kind of a, a situation where people got a bit too enthusiastic about the way Seahawks games have gone thus far, or the way Lions games have gone thus far. I cannot overlook the fact that Pete Carroll is one of the coaches in this game. Pete Carroll is not someone you'd expect to see in a total of, a game with a total of 50 when Geno Smith is his quarterback. So to me, with the the Seahawks projecting to be a bit uh, run heavy, as always, uh, with Detroit missing a guy who can spring a lot of big plays, I think the under is the way to play this thing. So two totals I like this week, uh, the Browns Falcons under 49 and a half and the Lions Seahawks under 50. Do you want to go through a couple where my numbers are showing value, but I have not bet yet? Um I might, but I haven't done it yet. One of those is the Dolphins plus three and a half. The reason that I'm guessing the, the market is higher on the Bengals here is because of the fact the Dolphins defense just ran 90 plays in the Miami Heat, now plays Thursday. Bad situation. And I will be honest, that's why I've not bet this one yet. It does stick out to me. But this Dolphins offense, I think is pretty legit. You look at their numbers so far, even in games where they placed uh, played a decent defense in Buffalo. I still respect uh, the New England defense, despite the fact they got shredded by Lamar Jackson this past week. The Miami offense is freaking good, man. Like they, their efficiency number is very good. I had a pretty high prior for them in terms of passing efficiency. They have exceeded that. So it could be a situation where my numbers are just overreacting because I had the high prior because they've been so good so far. That's part of it. The defensive rest stuff is a bigger issue for me. So I'm showing value plus three and a half on Miami. If it were to move more, if we get a situation where everyone talks about the defensive rest and suddenly it gets to four, four and a half, the money line keeps moving, then I could buy into Miami. I've not done so yet, but um, I'm, I'm open to it is what I would say. I've not gone there yet though. Other one is new England plus 10 and a half. Um, I don't want to bet on Brian Hoyer. Really? I don't really want to, but Putting him in there as the New England starting quarterback, it's under 10 for me. Um, so getting 10 and a half is enticing, in part because of the fact I think it's an overreaction to Mac Jones being out, but also because this is probably going to be a pretty low-scoring game. Green Bay has shown that if they've got a lead, they don't really care too much about running up the score. They just want to win the football game, get themselves to the postseason, and be in position to play well then. They don't care as much about this. So narratively, I can see plus 10 and a half. Um, from a a uh, data perspective, I see plus 10 and a half because I can't get to that number based on my numbers, but it's just so hard mentally to bet on Brian Hoyer. That's part of why this number is big. You know, they know, sports books know people don't want to bet Brian Hoyer. They want to bet Aaron Rodgers in this matchup. So I'm still considering it. I might go 10 and a half. We saw it move from nine and a half overnight to 10 and a half now. Maybe it keeps on moving and maybe I buy in then. I, I think I'm tempted because, again, it is such a low total game. I haven't gone there yet. But I, I think that if between these two, I'm probably more likely to bite on my on uh, New England than I am on Miami just because of the way this game sets up. Uh, so between those two, more likely to bite on New England. I am trying value on the Chargers right now facing off with Houston. I had to take uh, my son, Rashawn Slater, out of this matchup, which broke my heart because Rashawn Slater – one of the best ta left tackles in all the league. Taking him out, though, still shows value in the Chargers. Now, right now, they're uh, five and a half at FanDuel Sportsbook. I saw a couple four and a halves this morning, which is part of why I've not bet it yet, because I'm curious to see if this number does keep moving and keep on coming down. It's uh, four and a half right now at DraftKings, minus 115 on the Chargers side of things. The five and a half at FanDuel does stand out relative to the market. So I want to sit out here. I will probably wind up betting the Chargers eventually, but I think we could see a situation where maybe we see a lot of money coming on Houston because of, you know, no Rashawn Slater, bad vibes around the Chargers, given that Brandon Staley has suddenly gone opposite end of the spectrum in terms of being hyper, hyper conservative as opposed to hyper, hyper aggressive. I think the Chargers are the right side here. I just want to see what number I can get before I actually bet it. So not betting a five and a half am showing value there. I want to see if the four and a half cave or the five and a half cave. Once one of those cave, I will be willing to dive in, but I want to see which direction that goes first. If I can get a four and a half, I, I want it, but for right now, holding off. So considering the Dolphins plus three and a half, uh, the, the Patriots plus 10 and a half and the Chargers minus five and a half, but holding off for right now, the ones I do like as of now, Washington money line plus 150, the Titans money line plus 148 or three and a half. If you can get that. The Denver money line plus 112 and the Rams plus two and a half at minus 110 totals. I like Browns Falcons under 49 and a half and the Lions Seahawks under 50. 
So we'll see how things go there. Now, before we wrap up, we got to do covering the past year and recap what went down this past week on the college football side of things. Ed was one and one this past week, although two and one, if you did go with one of the leans that he mentioned, Ed had Maryland plus 17. They lost that game by seven. Uh, so good showing by Maryland. Honestly, played pretty well the entire game. Not a fluky cover. They just played well. So he got Maryland plus 17 there. He had Tennessee minus 10 and a half. That one looked pretty good in the third quarter, early fourth quarter. Florida, though, scored twice to make it a five-point game. It wound up being there. Game did close at 11, so half a point of movement there for Ed. Uh, didn't quite get the win, but uh, on the back door there by Florida. Not really a back door because they had a shot to win that game, but, you know, uh, they did rally late to cover there. So one in one week. Also, Ed did say he liked Ohio State minus 18 and a half. Uh, they won by 31, so hopefully you followed him on the lean there. But overall, a one in one week on the official bets for Ed. NFL side didn't go super well. I'm not sure if this was true for you all as well, but for me, not the best week by any means. I was two and four. I had the, the Titans Raiders under 46 and a half. That closed at 46. I was at the airport and couldn't see that game. So I had up my phone and saw the, the Hollins touchdown and was like, oh boy, here we go. Two point conversion. Luckily, the Titans did, did hold. Uh, so I finished at 46 as the Raiders missed two-point conversion to get the win there. Other hit was the Denver money line at minus 102, but I got bad movement there. So it feels like a hollow win. Not sure if I would have won that had Trent Williams not gotten hurt. So even one of the wins I got felt bad. So uh, not the best week there. Other misses, uh, the misses for me were the Cardinals plus four, got good movement to plus three and a half. The Steelers plus five and a half got good movement there. I would not have won, uh, even if that lateral at the end did not happen. So that wasn't even a bad beat, just a beat, despite getting good movement there. I had the Chiefs minus five and a half. Weird game all around. Uh, and then last night, I had Zeke Alley under 72 and a half, rushing plus receiving yards. He finished the 75. The second he had that long, like 20 or whatever yard it was rush, I knew I was toast. I didn't think it'd be as close as it was, honestly, to, to still lose by just two and a half yards, but... Once he had that long run, I was toast. So I'm okay betting against long runs for Zeke Elliott in the year 2022. So the fact that it didn't work out, I'm okay with that. You know, I think honestly, that's true of most of them. Uh, Tanner Hudson didn't score as well. Mentioned him uh, 11 to one score touchdown for the Giants last night. I honestly feel pretty good about the process for most of those. I think I, you know, maybe I shouldn't have bet the Broncos, but that's one of the games that wound up winning. I don't know. I'm on them again this week. Uh, I think that, Maybe I should have been more reactive to the fact that Jimmy Garoppolo was starting. Public seemed to like uh, the 49ers a lot in that one. There was a lot of money on the 49ers too. So I think the biggest mistake I made was one of the bets that won on the Broncos money line. So odd week for sure. Um, feel good about the Zeke bet. Feel good about the Steelers, uh, the Chiefs as well. So, you know, not a good week, but I don't think it was a bad process week on most as outside of potentially the Denver one. Ryan Williams, uh, we had him on Thursday and Monday to talk about the full slate and then about the Monday night football game. Ryan rallied a bit Monday night uh, to close out the week on a high note. He hit the Zeke Elliott anytime touchdown at plus 150. Also hit the under on that game, 39 and a half, finished with 39 uh, points there. So uh, good job by Ryan on both of those. Lone miss stream last night with the Tony Pollard first half touchdown. That one was five to one, so obviously not a full unit bet there. Uh, but two and one night for Ryan overall there. Finished the week four and five overall. Uh, got the Bears money line at minus 138. Got to watch that victory in person as well because he's a season ticket holder. He had the Bengals minus five and a half against the Jets. Jets never really, like, the Bengals didn't play great, but the Jets still never really had a chance to cover in that game. So those were the other wins besides the Monday night game. And this is where the Bills Dolphins over 52 and a half, Eagles Commanders over 47 and a half, Bucks minus one and a half, 49ers minus one and a half. Uh, but good finish by Ryan on Monday, uh, and still overall good year for Ryan thus far. JJ Zacharies and bad luck on his props, missed a couple by thin margins. He was hitting the Tom Brady passing yards under 22, 45 and a half the entire game. Brady got their super latest and garbage to Russell Gage. Traylon Burks almost scored. For the anytime touchdown, that was plus 280. That got super close. Other touchdown props were Amon Ross St. Brown plus 135, DJ Chark plus 230. Then he had Joe Mixon over 73 and a half rushing yards. Um, that one didn't hit because Mixon effectively got benched late in that game. But good read by JJ on two other backfields. He was on uh, Travis Etienne over 16 and a half receiving yards. And part of the analysis there was hey, you know, the Jags are underdogs in this game that should be more of a etn script versus robinson that didn't happen but etn still hit the over it hit pretty early on he finished with 30 receiving yards there so even with the script not going to plan 
Still got the the bet there for JJ with the ETN receiving yards. Other one was uh, the Patriots backfield. He was talking about Ramondre Stevenson's role. Now props were not up at that time, but Stevenson probably hit the over on every market. Uh, he had 73 rushing yards, 28 receiving yards. He had a touchdown in that game. So if you had gone rushing yards, receiving yards, rushing plus receiving yards, you would have hit on that one. So bad luck by JJ on the, uh, the Tom Brady over the Burks non touchdown there, but still good process across the board. So disappointing week, uh, for us here on the podcast, I think for me, I was on try to remain level-headed in terms of like analysis, uh, analyzing like, was I correct in this? And I think the Denver one is the one that I'm questioning the most right now. So we'll see. Uh, move on to this week. I think this week I there are numbers I feel pretty good about. If I were predicting one to feel bad about next week on Tuesday when we're doing the recap, it's probably the Washington money line, maybe more so than the Denver one, but my numbers are showing value. I trust my numbers. They back test pretty well. So despite a bad week this past week, still feeling pretty good, as we get said, for week number four. That's all we got here on the podcast for today. Big show. Every Tuesday, we go through golf, MLB, and NFL. Big thank you once again to Pitching Ninja, Rob Freeman, for breaking down his thoughts on tonight's strikeout props. Check him out on Twitter at Pitching Ninja. Check out his work at MLB, Fox, Nesson, and Peacock. Big thank you to Brandon Gadula at Gadula13, his simulations he mentioned, are over on numberfire.com. He'll cover the DFS side of things on the Number Fire Daily Fantasy Podcast feed later on today. I'm on Twitter at Jim Sonnes, J-I-M-S-A-N-N-E-S. You can also follow the FanDuel Podcast Network at FanDuel Podcast. We'll be back once again tomorrow in the afternoon talking about college football week number five with Ed Fang and Colin Wilson for the Action Network. That'll be a whole lot of fun. We'll talk to you then. Good luck with your strikeout props for tonight. We'll talk to you once again soon. This has been Covering the Spread right here on the FanDuel Podcast Network. <laughs> <laughs>